Good morning. Um, what we did last time for RNA seq is we looked at basically processing the data. And we just assumed that processing the data with a standard pipeline will kind of give us informative enough of an output that we can take it to downstream analysis, doing some statistical analysis like differential gene expression, and then look at different uh, data mining techniques and uh, interpretation. So today we want to go a little bit more in depth. And the sections that we will be using is the section there on top uh, that will give us processing data and differential gene expression as a single uh, interface. And then over here, you can see the supervised, unsupervised analysis, um, and then uh, visualization and annotation. We'll go through these things a little bit more in detail. But before we do that, just a little bit of an overview of what we did last time. So we talked about pre-processing steps that uh, help us eliminate some technical variability, uh, like removing adapters and PCR duplicates. We talked about mapping and different approaches to mapping where we can align the reads to either a reference genome or the known transcript. So we can just use the uh, GTF file that contains all the beginning and end uh, positions of uh, exons and then map all of our reads only there. And then we talked about a combined strategy to do that. We talked about different methods of quantification. Um, and specifically, we, you probably saw how RSEM, uh, a method that is uh, used for quantification, actually takes a very long time to run. Um, and then we talked about differential gene expression and two options that we had for DSEC2 and edge on. Now, um, the standard approach, uh, this is a protocol published uh, in 2012, so quite a while back. Uh, but basically, just an idea, there are a lot of different mapping and alignment techniques, and there's a lot of different tools to do all of this. Uh, so a group of uh, researchers came up with just kind of like a gold standard that you should take uh, to process the data and do differential gene expression, and it's called the Tuxedo. Uh, uh, pipeline or protocol, and so basically uh, we did the same the same thing last time, right? So we used Top Hat um, as uh, your mapper um, that includes in it already bow tie, and then you have these uh, cufflinks, cuff merge, uh, cuff diff potentially if you want to do differential gene expression, um, and then you can modify each one of these steps. So you can use uh, star as your align, alignment or BWA instead of bow tie. And so you can replace the different sections, but the overall idea is the same. Um, and, and this is what it looked like um, last time when we did it. And so you can see top hat, which today has been replaced by high sat two. And then you have cufflinks, cuff merge, and then you take that information and you align uh, all of your reads on identified transcripts, and then you have to uh, prepare an expression table, and that is the step of quantification. Now, there are other approaches to alignment, and one of the significant ones that has been introduced, I believe in 2014, um, is alignment that is not, so uh, a quantification or identification of genes without the alignment step. And that is an approach that significantly reduces time, and it's based on a different idea. So the idea in alignment, in uh, what we typically do with bow tie and top hat, is that we know specific regions, and then each read could be aligned to different segments with different quality. So you have to kind of try an alignment multiple times and then evaluate the quality of alignment and then choose the best one or choose a certain threshold uh, below which you don't want to continue aligning. And so that is the computationally intensive uh, step that could be replaced by a different approach that instead of using the reads and the length of that read, it just breaks everything down into specific length of a segment called KMER. So you can define what the K would be, but it could be 50 nucleotides, 100 nucleotides long, whatever it is. And then you can uh, separate all of your reads and all of your gene uh, positions into the same uh, length segments and then find matches. And computationally, that's a significantly less intensive procedure. Um, so SailFish uh, does that. 
And then you can also um, uh, improve your uh, uh, quantification speed by using a similar approach. And, and here you have an example of HTSeq uh, count. Um, and there's the publication on HTC. So those two approaches, just important to know that the quality uh, in the end is going to be very comparable, specifically for genes and known isoforms. Uh, in some cases, people report that it's not as accurate for non-coding RNA. So if you don't have poly A, if you have total RNA sequencing, and you're looking for additional information that is beyond genes and uh, isoforms, uh, you might want to consider not using these methods, but if you're looking for speed and efficiency, uh, this would be the way to go. Now, finally, we talked about uh, DSEC2 and HR, and there the main two considerations are the significance of a gene that you think or that has been identified as differentially expressed, and uh, your um, log fold change, your fold change. How, not just whether there is a significant change, but also quantifying the difference. And so um, to jump to this, so a lot of pipelines are built around this step. Uh, the assumption is that you have two groups of samples, and you want to identify what is the difference between them. Not in all cases is that possible to say I've got these two groups. And so what we want to talk about today is before this step, how do we um, critically look at our own data and understand what is signal versus noise and um, see um, how um, preparation of our data actually impacts this final step that we're all interested in. What is the biological variation that we're trying to study? So here are some questions that you know, we want to review today. How do we evaluate the data quality uh, before we jump to conclusions about what this means? What is the quality of our data? Uh, the second is, what do we consider to be our signal? Do we actually take the raw data that we got, or do we have to do some transformation to that data before we jump into uh, this analysis? And then also, what is the objective of the study? And, and that, of course, is going to be linked to how can we interpret and validate our results. And so the first big um, kind of section I think that is uh, very important and a lot of times overlooked is exploratory data analysis and transformation normalization of your raw data. So as you remember, FPKM was the measurement that we used to quantify our reads and their abundance in a specific gene. And FPKM stands for fragments per kilobase per million, which means that we are taking two assumptions or two um, data points uh, beyond just abundance of reads. And that is the total number of reads as well as the length of a gene. So if you have a very long gene, uh, its abundance is not going to be um, uh, it, it, it is going to be affecting how many reads could potentially fall on it, right? And how many total reads you have also is going to have the same impact. But it turns out that just using that data in certain situations is not going to be enough normalized for us to do subsequent steps. And the way we can check that is by just taking a look at the table of expression that we got last time. Now, all of you have this uh, data from either the pipeline that you ran or in the zip file that I, download, that I sent to you, but this is what it looks like. You have the gene, uh, the genes are your rows, the samples are your columns, and you have two groups, right? So you really have two conditions that we're comparing here. We have normal light and cloud and low. So typically when you do an experiment like that, you're assuming that within each group, you have replicates, right? So you're really saying that all of these samples represent uh, one condition and all of these samples represent another condition. Therefore, if you were to map how the same gene is expressed between these two samples, you're expecting them to be fairly similar, right? So um, if you do that, you are going to expect that all of the values are going to be distributed along this line, right? But, but in this case, this is FPKM 
uh, data and you can do this yourself, it, it looks nothing like they're correlated, right? So we're actually making a wrong assumption here, thinking that they are replicants. And uh, because of that, a standard step before going further is to use logarithmic scale. And uh, we'll talk a lot about why this is important, but um, what you have in, in your folder, just, you know, if you want to follow along and see uh, what that looks like in the data itself, um, in the folder, you have um, this file called uh, cell lines, expression genes, Okay, so this was the original table, and you can see just at the range of numbers that you have in this table, right? You have uh, very small values like 8 um, and even 0 0.1, and then you have fairly large ones in the thousands, right? So you have uh, 2,500 here, uh, you have, uh, you know, so many different types, so you have a, a variance uh, of data that you're dealing with. And one of the ways to just see what we're looking at, right, is uh, if you take the same uh, data point and you transform it into normal logarithm scale. So you can take this plus one because you can't take logarithm of zero. So you have to have something there so you can use one and you will get uh, this transform table. And it turns out that using this as signal is going to improve the quality of your um, comparison between these replicates, right? So if you look at original FPKM versus logarithmic scale, you can now see that the values are more aligned with this line meaning that we can rely on this data to represent the group that we have them in. But to do a more in-depth analysis of this, you have to look at a few other parameters. It's not enough to just do logarithmic scale and assume, you know, every time this is going to be exactly uh, correct. And, and there's a few things that we're going to discover here about the quality of data as well as we do some summary statistics. So, um, in Excel, and again, you don't have to do this in Excel, but because it's a you know easy to use tool, we can do it in Excel, and everybody can add the data package in Excel that allows you to do this. You can run descriptive statistics, and uh, you will get a number of statistical measurements about your data set. So you will get things like um, the mean, the standard error, median, mode, etc. So you will get a number of parameters that you can deal with to summarize your data. And if we visually plot this information, we will actually see that there is a difference between the two uh, groups of samples, right? So as you can see over here, it appears that in normal-like samples, uh, the mean is higher. Um, you can also see on this side that the sum is higher and the sample variance is higher. And what is um, important about this is right now we don't know why, right? So what we want to discover is how to normalize, but also why do we see this difference and whether it represents some biological, biologically meaningful uh, data point or not. Here on this side, you can see for those two samples that we consider as the yeah, Um Just to go back a little bit, I was just a little confused about what exactly we're taking the log uh, volt change of. Um, like in the slide, you have just one column uh, where the operation is done. So is that just an example from what, I mean, we're taking the, the log volt change of the raw data not the full change, uh, maybe yes, or I, I'll delete this, right? So this is just exactly what we're doing, is we want to replicate all of these samples, right? Mm -hmm. And just do log scale of all of the uh, data points. So I want to take this gene and this value of its expression 
and I want to convert it to log scale. So what I would do is I will take normal logarithm of this plus one, and I just do that because now I can copy and paste it and not worry about the zeros, right? And so I can, um, you know, stretch it out, and I will get it for all of the samples, right? Each, each column, and then and then when you're comparing two columns with the correlation plot, now they look more correlated. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So and, and uh, we can do that right now. Um, so let's copy this. Okay, so now I have the logarithm scale, and just so that we see what exactly I'm trying to do here. So, right, so these are going to be the same samples, the same expression values for the same genes, but in a different scale. Now, if we take these two. And we just say, let's do a scatter plot, right? So that is what you were seeing on the slide. And now let's do the same thing, but for this one. So we take these two. And you see it like that. All right, and in a little bit, we'll see kind of what exactly, how else can we look at all of this to, to understand other things about the data. So now another way to look at the data is to prepare a histogram. And, and this is what you're seeing on this side. And why is that important? So a histogram says, let's take a bin from zero to five, for example, right over here, zero to five or zero to 74 on the raw scale. Um, and let's take everything, separate them into these bins and just count how many of the genes do I have that have this expression? And so what you can see is that you have a lot of outliers and then most of your data in the very low end. So why is that bad? That's bad because let's take t-test or any other kind of uh, statistical test. It's going to have some assumptions about the distribution and it's going to look for how the means are different or some kind of a statistical aspect of the data and, and measure that difference. And when you have something that looks like that, that means that these numbers that you are interested in that are all over here as, are going to be underrepresented. They're not as significant because they're, you know, on uh, the scale of everything, they're in the lower values. Now let's take a look at the same descriptive statistics, but for logarithm scale. And so you can see now that everything is kind of more stretched out. So if you compare this to seeing something under the light or outside of the light, right? If you are trying to compare colors and it's dark, it's not as easy to differentiate between dark red and dark green, right? But if you have bright light, then now you can see what's even, um, you know, maybe define it much better, what is the difference? And that is what this really allows you to do. Um, and now you can start seeing other things that emerge from this transformation. For example, uh, right here, you know, the mean and the median and standard error, they're about the same, but all of a sudden kurtosis is sticking out right here, right? So you can see that for the normal light, it's much higher. And this brings us to another point that is going to be very important about our data, and that is variance in... Uh, you know, distribution of values uh, that we want to take a look at. And specifically here, what you can notice is that you have this, um, this thing coming up here, and um, it's again in the low values, right? So even for logarithmic scale in your uh, cloud and low samples, you have quite a lot of genes with low expression. And the question is why? 
you know, is this something that is biologically meaningful that I'm going to want to pay attention to? Or is this something that is not worth my attention and I don't really want to look there? Um, so if we overlay one sample on the other, just in terms of their histogram, what we um, can see is that they are different from the normal distribution. And we want to look at the, so the bottom, you know, if we want to take a look at differentially expressed genes, a lot of genes are going to be differentially expressed, right? So you have, um, you know, these probably, I mean, all of these are going to be differentially expressed. Um, but the question is, how believable is it that they actually are? And because there's such low values, it's actually indistinguishable from noise. So you cannot rely on them. Just randomly doing different sequencing techniques, you know, different machines, you will get a lot of this variation. So that is not what you want to pay attention to. Then you have this hump in the middle. And those are going to be representative of normal gene expression. So if you take any two living cells, they have to function in a certain way. So you have a lot of genes that are responsible for that functionality, and they're going to be present even in cancerous cells or other types of cells. So you don't want to, I mean, they're going to be informative, of course, but they're not going to be as informative. But then here, you actually have a very significant signal. And that is the signal that we want to look at. So if we want to focus on the signal, then we need to separate somehow between the signal and the noise. And the way to do this is to draw a line between these two. And what we've seen in a lot of publications that have been looking at different gene expression data using Illumina sequencers is that it's going to be right around five uh, on, on logarithmic scale. So if you take your gene expression, you transform it to logarithmic scale, everything below that threshold of five is going to be very noisy. Everything above that logarithmic scale of five is going to be of interest. And one of the methods that you can use to separate the signal from the noise is to use quantal normalization. So let's do that together. What we will use is um, this file right here, cell lines filter six. And we can go um, to the platform and just quickly do this together. Just a little bit bigger. And I hope that everybody's got a, the account information with you. If you don't, I have a test account that you can use. So everybody's got their account information? Okay. Okay, so what we want to do is go down here under utilities and upload um, this file that we have. Um, So go under cell lines, and then you have this cell lines filter six. It should look something like that. You have your gene IDs and the sample IDs and nothing else. Continue. And here you've got quantile normalization. So what does quantile normalization do? Quantile normalization takes these differences and aligns them by aligning the mean and then normalizing everything to go from the mean. So if you, uh, if your mean is five in, in this you know, group of samples and in this group of samples it's 10, they're gonna both end up being the same number. And then everything will stay the same, but from that point. And uh, I think if you read through this down here, there's a, um, a link that you can read more about this. Uh, but here, you also have the option to already transform this to logarithmic scale, so you don't have to do this in Excel or manually. Uh, so you can just go ahead and press yes. Um, and here, you can set the threshold to be five. Now, what will happen if you don't do a threshold? It will be exactly the same. So if you don't do any threshold, then your output file is still going to 
contain some variability inside, but much less. Um, and if you do a threshold of five, it's going to actually leave everything above five to be um, more comparable. So uh, you want to focus on that signal. Um, and you can also do PCA, but in our case, um, well, actually, let's go ahead and just do that. You also have some filtering abilities right here. So if you want to go ahead and uh, set up a filter, you have two options. You can do a fixed number, uh, like filter everything below a certain threshold, which we already did in quantum normalization. Um, or you can just take only the 25%, right? So what is interesting a lot of times when you do PCA is you want to focus on the variability that is most representative of the differences between the samples, uh, the samples that you have. So you can also do that. In our case, we don't have to do that. Let's just go ahead and save. And um, save it and run it. Now, today we are going to look at another um, at another um, project that I want to tell you about. If, um, if you take a long time, it gets stuck, so just go ahead and click on one pipeline. The other project that I have here is a project also about breast cancer. Um, and there you can see a lot more of the impact of quantile normalization on the end result. So I also prepared this data set that we can take a look at, uh, at together. So let's prepare another pipeline for... Um, uh, for this file right here, which is the exact same thing. It's just um, expression values for all the samples. So we can click here, create utilities and analysis pipeline, and we can go into DCAIS, is what it's called, ductal carcinoma in situ. And you can take a look. So this is the file. One down normalization, transform to logarithmic scale, threshold of five. Okay. okay. So what is this going to give us? To look at how we can interpret this data, instead of going through all the steps of summary statistics and looking at individual parameters that um, we have been reviewing up until now, a useful way to kind of summarize your data is to use box plots. And so box plots, just to understand what we're looking at, they summarize the data in a visual way that is easy to kind of get a feel for um, as you look at all of your samples. So it will plot all of your conditions or all of your samples um, or groups of samples if you want to, and then provide you with the minimum and the maximum value, the median value, and you can also add the mean value to here, and then your um, interquartile inter range. So the, the range between 25 and 75 is going to be in your box, um, or you can look at the whole range. And then we'll also a lot of times plot outliers, so you can take a look at what that looks like. So if we do this, and I'll show you here in a second how to do that in Excel if you would like to, but basically this is what it looks like for um, raw data, for the FPKM data. So the same idea, right? All we see is basically the outliers and all of our main values are down at the lower end of the scale. Um, and uh, if you do logarithmic scale, you kind of stretch everything out, right? So what will happen after um, quartile normalization? Let's take a look. So let's go back to our table. Um, we don't need these. Well, let's keep them. Let's put them up here. 
So um, this was for um, how correlated they are, right? And now what we can do is we can just select all of this. And again, in Excel, you also have this function. So you can just do box and whisker. And it will show you what we were just seeing there, right? So everything is down at the bottom. Let's take a look at the logarithmic scale. Okay, so now you can see a lot more in this chart. Um, and again, you kind of see uh, also the X is the mean, uh, the line is the median. What you can see here by just focusing on that, for example, is that the mean and the median are not aligned for the normal length, but they are aligned for uh, cloud and low, which is actually um, interesting. So. Now let's take a look at our pipelines so that we can get the quartile normalized data. So my pipeline finished here, and then you have this all quantile normalization. And download, actually it's also here. Take that. And let's open that in Excel. And we can just copy it over to um, this spreadsheet right here. So what will happen to these? <coughs> so as you remember, we didn't have to do the um, logarithmic scale in Excel. We just kind of did it within quantile normalization itself. What you can see is that, you know, we, we gave it a threshold. So it's not perfectly aligned, but it's much more aligned between them. And it's kind of similar to logarithmic scale, right? But, but not exactly. So uh, if we take a look at um, how these top ends are aligned, right? They're not aligned here at all. And here they are aligned, right? Um, at the bottom, you have a lot more outliers. So it really adds an additional uh, layer of alignment between these. And so we can start looking at them as more representative of replicates. So let's go ahead and uh, look at what we were doing before. So um, this was 721 and 634. Okay, so this is what you get, and you can also eliminate the threshold if you want and see what will happen if you just align everything. But I see what you're doing, but in pipes were not there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you didn't forward them, so what happened is there are no links. I just have the names. Yeah. Well, well why don't you look um, over here? Um, one second. So if you go to um, the EDU site, and go to the organization page. I pasted the download link right here. And there's the link that Sahil posted earlier. Did anyone else not receive the files? Didn't some of the Excel documents when I extracted them, they were just empty. I have only the names, but there are more no files. I can show you the link. Yeah, I got it in five minutes, but can you see this? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so my email is not blocked. I mean, it 
has not been sent any money. No use sent if you got a guy. Only problem is that it is. So could you go back to the LGLMP? <coughs> Go to the top and just reload this page. Yeah, yeah, hold it. Yeah, don't, don't go back. So we're working on cell lines. And here in a second, we'll take a look at the yeah. Did everybody else get the files? OK, so what we were doing is we were um, you know, just doing quantile normalization and looking at the impact. And so right now, uh, we know that our data is normalized and it's ready for analysis. But what we um, can oftentimes C is that this transformation can sometimes not impact PCA at all. It can change it vis visually, as you can see the difference here. This is raw versus normalized, but there's not a lot of significance to our ability to interpret, right? So sometimes you just see and, okay, the numbers kind of switch their positions, but it's basically the same thing, right? There's not a lot of difference. Maybe it's wider between them. Uh, but what it will change is the number of statistically significant differentiated uh, genes. So you can see that this is uh, the raw, the logarithm scale, the quantile normalized. Uh, so depending on your threshold, what you might consider as differentially expressed genes in the raw scale will actually not be um, statistically significant enough if you go and you normalize your data. So now the interesting part, the part about why this might be. So what you can see here is in addition to the tables of expression, you also get mapping statistics on how many reads were aligned during the mapping process. And you can see here the difference between normal-like, right? So the rate of alignment for normal-like and the rate of alignment for cloud and low is actually different. Um, which means that the number of reads that were aligned to uh, the genome uh, or to the transcriptome in our case is different. And what that could mean is that this is just a representation of, uh, you know, contamination, uh, different hands, different uh, uh, machines used to actually do the sequencing. So this is really technical noise um, that is influencing our analysis. Now, let's take a look at the DCAS data. Um, we ran this pipeline. Uh, so let me um, download it. So we did quantile normalization. So let's download that data right here. And let me tell you briefly about this uh, data set. This is a uh, number of samples between actual normal um, healthy tissues, um, which is a little bit different from the cell lines that we were dealing with that are not, even the normal like are actually cancer cell lines, but they're um, just not specific to any subtype. Um, and uh, DCAS. So DCAS 
is an early stage cancer that for some reason, for some patients, they end up developing aggressive cancers and some patients don't. So one of the major challenges uh, with DCAS is trying to differentiate between those two. How can you know whether a patient with DCAS with a tumor uh, will end up having an aggressive uh, cancer and which patient is not? And so what you can see here is um, it's annotated here on top for each one of your samples. You have normal, right? And then you have uh, different classification by PAM50. We talked about it last time, uh, but basically all of those are DCAS. So they have not really become uh, late stage tumors at this point. So if we take this data, right, this is the normalized data. What we can see, uh, let's just quickly do here a box plot. about a computationally intensive task. Okay, there we go. So these are all of our samples after normalization. And what I want to do is I want to see the impact of this normalization on um, PCA. So, and, and I'll explain a little bit more what exactly PCA does again as a review. So here you can see all of our samples fairly comparable, right? So you can't really tell a big difference, uh, even though you do see a little bit more, a little bit higher outliers on this side. So this data, uh, now let, let's quickly try and um, before I go into kind of like how to interpret this, let's just uh, prepare a couple of pipelines here with this data set. Let's go to unsupervised analysis and upload both the normalized and the not normalized data for DCAS. So we can take this one, which was the original data, and we can run PCA, we can do the R library. And I'll explain in a little bit kind of what we're doing here exactly. So this is going to be PCA of raw DCIS data. And then we will do the same thing with the normalized. So this one was under my downloads. So what I want to demonstrate here is that actually sometimes these steps that are linked to eliminating this technical variability will play a role in our ability to detect some variance in our data sets. So to quickly um, explain that, let me review, I think we did this last time, but just to refresh everybody's memory, what is PCA? PCA is a good way for me to see all of my data 
in a snapshot just to understand what the sample variation is based on all of my genes, right? So here's how it works. If we just have gene one and gene two for all of our samples, we can select those genes, right? And then we can build a scatter plot. So the scatter plot will show us sample and the X will be gene one and the Y will be gene two, right? So it's just a simple uh, chart of what we have in the data. But we have a lot more genes, right? So we can add the third gene and we'll have a three dimensional plot. But how do we get all of our genes into this scatter plot? That's the question. So the dimensions, or the features over here on the side, the genes, need to all be represented into something that is visually interpretable for us. So the way to do this is to try to create a new set of dimensions based on variance in our data. And those are going to be, are going to be called principal components. So if we have low variance, uh, is not interesting to us. If we have high variance, we want to focus on the high variance. And then within that high variance, we want to project new vectors and then project everything onto those two or a number of three components. And so as a result, we get PC1 and PC2 as our X and Y, and now we can project everything onto those new components. What does it do us? It gives us the location of each sample within the space of variance of our whole data set. Okay, so it just takes, instead of looking, I mean, the classic example is if you look at a pen this way, right, I can't really tell a lot about it. If I look at it this way, now I understand kind of some features about my data set. So that's the same thing that we're doing here. We're twisting everything in a multi dimensional space to find the best way to um, represent the variance in our data. So now let's see at the result of our pipelines and how normalization changed the picture when we did this um, transformation with quantile normalization. So here I have my PCA of raw DCAS. And I can take a look at the plots, for example. Again, what you can see here is you have some outliers right here, right? And then the rest of your data is down here. So let's say I don't know which is normal and which is DCIS. I can assume that maybe some of them over there are normal and the rest are DCIS, but I don't really have a way to, um, to check that, right? So, I mean, this, um, if I go back and check my annotation, I will actually discover that this is not normal. So, if I um, open this um, just so I have a little more control over the, the plot, I can take at the table and, and again, do this manually just so that I understand the position of my samples. So let's open it here and I'll close this heavy box plot. So what I have here is my um, principal components, those projections in the space that describes my samples. And uh, this one, right, these two could be chosen to represent my data set. So I can see that some of them are right here, right? The rest are down here. So now I can mark them right so actually here we have uh, the annotation within the name of our samples so you can see that all of these are normal so let me just insert some uh, groups here so these are all of my normal and these would be all DCIS right And now if I use that information in my, uh, in my chart, these would be the normal ones. So I would take 
just the x for the normal and the y for the normal. And then do the same thing for DCIS. And let's see what happens. So what happens is that actually I have a split in my DCIS. So let me just add here uh, the legend. So you can see that bigger. Okay, so the normal ones are actually right here. And this is some kind of a split between DCIS. So it doesn't show me the variance in my data. The biggest variance isn't between normal and cancer. It's actually within the cancer data set. And that shouldn't happen, right? Just biologically speaking, that's not what we're expecting to see. Um, and so what it means is that there is some variability in the data that can confuse me. If I don't have the annotation, the clinical annotation of what these samples, just by looking at the data, I will come to wrong uh, conclusions. And so you can now see, uh, let's go back to the normalized data. And by the way, I don't want to be just doing this myself. I mean, I'm hoping that some of you are able to follow along. And so if you're not, maybe let's try to address that. It's very fast. The way you're right. So yeah, so let's take a pause and make sure that everybody can follow along. So did, any, did anyone succeed at creating the normalization pipeline? Yeah? Yes? So a few of you have. So you have it. Um, yeah, so when I tried to pull it up on the Tauber website, there's some issue where it won't let you scroll down to actually do PCA. Um, Can you see that? Yeah, sure. So here, this is the utilities that yeah. I uploaded. Wow. Um, what do you to do? Just the, you go to DCIS. Yeah. Which one? Train? Uh, no, that filter. No, that. Yeah. Yes. That's what works fine. Yes. Okay. 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 Just zoom out, so control. Okay. And then this was. Uh, yeah, you don't have to change it. Just save. Okay, cool. Did anybody else have this problem? So the, for the second one, which one is the file for the DCIS? The one that says. Uh, no, 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 the third one. Third one in the folder. So in the DCIS, there's this one, it's called PRGNA, whatever, GE, FPKM filtered and did, right? So all that was done to this is it was processed, it's an FPKM, and the sample names are annotated. That's what the file name is. Does anyone else have some problems? I just got to the text files. Yeah, yeah, that's what you need, text files. So that third one, yeah, select that. Well, yeah, go back to the platform to online. Server. Type in server. So the same thing. Yeah. Server. Dot. D. Dash file. Bio. B I O. No, T dash is right. File. Delete the file. Dot. Do you have your account details for this? Yeah, log in. Do you have your account details? I'll get you another account here in a second. 
Did anyone else have any problem with this? You got to first click on start. So were you going to do point down the relation or you already did that yes. one? Yes. Probably, yeah. Right. Yeah, so you can either, yeah, that's good. All right. Yes. No, well, you got to, I just created it. I did Okay. Now we start, uh, we want this. Well, once it's done, you'll be able to download the txt file and just open it itself. Yeah. Did you figure out yours? Uh, yeah, I did. So what are, what are that file that, that you compared with the raw, the raw file? You compare one file with the raw file. Yeah, I just took the results from Quantum normalization and I opened it in the same Excel file. So, so just to kind of review, you all have this, the TXT, right? So this TXT, if you just open it in Excel, so this is the same TXT file, but in Excel, right? Now, what I did previously was I manually demonstrated how to transform this to logarithmic scale, but quantile normalization all, already does that for you. So what you can do is if your pipeline finished, if you go to the normalization, uh, so this was for DCIS, uh, DCIS QN, here you have the normalized file right here. So if you just download this file, did you run this pipeline? I'm running it right now. So just reload the page and it will be, I mean, it shouldn't take long. I'm not able to change the password. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you can't change the password. The password was emailed to you some time ago, but I'll give you inside here, you have this file called server T bio access. If you don't have access, this is a test account that you can use during this session. So these are the details that you can use for logging in. So test at Pine Biotech and then that's the password. Okay, the password, test by Pine Biotech. That's your login, test at timebiotech.com. And the password is down at the bottom, WF. Yeah. So it's like a conceptual question, yeah. uh, like dealing with the slides, I guess. So when we go in PCA, um, you know, you're starting to, you're, you're, at first we're plotting the gene uh, expression correlation. And then like we look at the... It's not very, correlation. These are samples. Now the dots are not genes, they're samples. Well, at first it, they're genes, right? It's, um, well, you're right, right. Well, it's a sample level of each gene. Yeah. Right, and then right. and then we can look at that for all genes together on one plot. Well, we can't uh, do it for all of them. We can only do it for a maximum of three because that would be mm -hmm. three dimensions. But how do we fit all of them into all of these? Mm -hmm. So, I guess what I'm asking is, when we finally get this this number um, that we're going to plot on our PCA plots, yeah, what um, are these numbers? Yeah, that's like an average of the variance of all the genes from so it takes all of your samples mm -hmm. or all of your genes sorry and it tries to find the variance associated with the whole data set not for each individual sample but with the whole data set and do a projection in this multi-dimensional space that we can't see mm -hmm. but pca can and do like a projection which is a vector of numbers and then take that vector and say, this is now your X and Y coordinates, PC1 and PC2, or PC2 and PC3. We, we can actually see the coordinate. So what is it that we're seeing in the PCA result over here? Mm -hmm. This number is, it's impossible to interpret it in gene expression values. It's just something that tells us something about the variance between all the samples, right? So it's unique to the data set that we're studying. Mm -hmm but it's not really interpretable back into gene expression values. There is a way to do that, which we go through in transcriptomics too, where you can use these projections and do reverse projection and actually interpret how can 
genes that are responsible for this sample being way out here, how do I find those genes? Right. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. But it's not this number. But you'll be is, able to expect that for that sample that it's going to have more significantly different genes. Yeah, but the question is which ones, right? Right. Well, you, you have to know. go look into that. Right. 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 So now, if I did, you know, let me take this group and this group and do differential gene expression, you can find the genes that are responsible for this separation. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of gives you an insight visually. What can these numbers, all of this gene expression, tell me about this group of samples that I'm studying? Or exclude maybe some samples like these in this yeah. far quadrant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which part of the right kind of You got to go back to areas of analysis. Yeah. And go under utilities. Upload your data. The TXT file. So add files and select what you downloaded. Yeah, we gotta actually here. Did you have something? Yeah, so in the utilities based PCA analysis, there's a parameter for transforming our table to logarithmic scale. Yeah. If you do quartile analysis and you do a logarithmic transformation there, you should turn off that option, correct? Right. Which when we did it here, we did so that's why I was asking. Okay, yeah, you shouldn't do that. But let's take a look at the results. For, did everybody um, get through this stage? So once you get this like normalized uh, data set, what do you do? Now, well, now we want to compare PCA of normalized data versus PCA of raw data and see what different conclusions will we get at if we do normalization. Did everybody? The yeah. one we have is a, is a raw data, right? And What's the one, that? The one we have, we have is raw data. Raw data, yeah. This one is raw data. Did, did it work for you, the point on normalization? Did it work for you? I'm just looking. Okay, so now if your pipeline has already finished, right, and you downloaded the results, so I'll just go, um, there are my pipelines, and then I have PCAS normalized PCA, what I called it. And uh, let's just download the table right away. So, opening it in Excel. And now I can do the same thing, right? So instead of jumping to the plot, let me just insert here um, what it is. So these are the normal, and these are DCS. And I just want to do this for myself to test whether what I will see will be different. So this is going to be normal. And what I do is I take the PC1 as X and PC2 as Y. And now I'm going to add the DCIS. So now I actually see what I am expecting to see, right? Let's just add the legend here. So again, the normal are, are the blue here. Did everybody get the same thing? So biologically speaking, it's much more reasonable to expect the normal tissue to be different from the cancer tissue in a more significant way than to have 
some one portion of the DCIS to be more different than everything else. And so I think that this is a good example of how working with your data, uh, with uh, transforming it to logarithmic scale, filtering for the noisy part, and then using methods like quantile normalization can help you get more biologically interpretable results. It's just a question. You, you, you mentioned before, uh, even uh, if we transform the data, or we uh, normalize the data, or we need the raw data, the VCA should not so much different, right? Well, the normal, the difference between normal and VCIS should be more significant than the difference between one group of DCIS and another group of DCIS, like we saw in the previous one, right? So just to kind of compare them side by side, right, if we take this, and, and I'll just write here that this is PCA of quantile normalized data. And let's take this back over here. So the previous example of raw data Right, if we didn't know that this is normal and this is the rest, let's say we were just examining a group of samples and you don't know anything about them. What you would naturally focus on is the difference between those and the rest, right? But now that you transformed it, you would naturally go to that kind of difference, which is the more correct way, right? So what I'm trying to demonstrate is that you know, you're typically not starting knowing already what you're looking for, right? You're just do sequencing and you're like, okay, let me now mine my data and see what's in it. And you could be confused if you don't have your data prepared for your analysis and going in a completely wrong direction. So did everybody get to this point? Do we have to more like both file in the same? Like same Excel file or is it different Excel file? Here? Well, this one is the same. I just copied the chart from the other one. So the the PCA result that I got from running that process gives me this. Yeah, this file. So it's kind of different from the other one. It doesn't have like PC one, PC two. Right. So um, but it's the same thing because these values are also in their parentheses. Okay. Yeah. But, but it's the same. I mean, you just know that it's PC1, PC2. And then you have a separate file which has like a subclassification of these different sure. No, you see it says right there normal, and then there's subtypes. So what I did is I added a column. If you yeah. just add another column and just, I manually typed it in, or you could. So these are so normal, and everything that's not normal is some PCAS. Yes. Okay. It's just that you have PAM50 classification in there, but it's not. Hey, you can play around with it. Mm -hmm. like, it's uploaded, yeah, 100%. So scroll down. And now continue. Start. Can you just look up the number and hold on? Now, remember here we did transformation to a logarithm and scale, so yes. And the threshold, do you remember what the threshold was? First, sorry, five, three, yes. And now you can either do PCA here with all the connections. You don't need to change anything, click on save. End. End. And now name your pipeline. Everybody else is good? Okay, so now that we prepared our data, what can we do with it? So one of the things that we talked about is PCA, how we can just explore our data, but it doesn't actually give us too much information beyond visually seeing some major trends in the data, right? It doesn't give us a lot of detail. Another method that we talked about was clustering. 
Now, the difference between PCA and clustering is that you can actually assign a number of groups. For example, let's say I'm expecting to see three major groups in my data. I can use, uh, you see an expected number of clusters, do three or four or whatever you feel like, and see what will happen. So again, it's an unsupervised analysis in the sense that I'm not telling uh, the clustering what each class is, what the groups are. I'm just kind of giving it a number and seeing what comes out. So let's try and do that. Okay, so now what we will do is go back to areas of analysis. And there's a reason why they're separated into two major groups, right? There's an unsupervised section right here, and then there's a supervised. And we'll talk about both of these today. But let's first go to unsupervised analysis. And we can use the same uh, normalized results that we have. Um, so, for example, the one for the DCIS data set. And we can select hierarchical clustering. And in a little bit, I'll explain what exactly it does. You can also read about it right here. You have several parameters. You have linkage, which is how these samples are going to be linked into clusters. So for example, you can use WARD2 is a good method for this type of data. You also have different ways to measure differences between the clusters because they have to separate into well-defined groups so we can keep it at Euclidean. And the numbers of clusters, I will expect three. Um, now it does have this option here to transpose or not transpose. Now transposing a table means that you've got your rows and you can flip them to the side and now your rows become columns or your columns become rows. And what is in our rows and columns? Our columns are sample names, right? And our rows are genes. So we can cluster either our genes based on samples, or we can cluster our samples based on genes. So this is the option. So in this case, we do need to transpose because we want to look at the difference between our samples and not the genes. And just click on end. Uh, this is hierarchical cluster. One pipeline. The other data set, let's just do this again, that we have is the cell lines. And there it's a lot more uh, classes, right? So I mean here we really have two or maybe three, but there we have a bunch. So here we can go back to the uh, folder that I gave you, the cell lines. And you can again take, um, well, we can, we can take this one. Well, hold on a second. Okay, actually before we do, well, we'll yeah, we can, we can use that just that later on we'll have to update the um, naming of those, but let's take a look at what happens. So hierarchical clustering, ward D2. So here we actually do expect five clusters because we have normal light, cloud and low, luminal, basal, um, and I think we have two types of luminal that we're expecting, so that we can find. And do transpose true, save, Okay, now what is hierarchical clustering? Let's go back to here. What hierarchical clustering does is, again, imagine this is our PCA or whatever projection of samples, so each dot represents a sample. It is called the bottom-up approach to clustering, so it really starts from identifying two points that are closest to each other in this multidimensional space. You use a specific distance measurement and says which ones are closest. If they are closest, 
then it links them together. So now this round circle around the two dots is considered to be a single point in the space. And then it identifies the next two closest points, and then it, more closest points, and it starts linking all of these points together until we get to a single cluster like this. And the result is all of this information is kept. So as a result, what we can do is we can build a dendrogram of all of our samples. So this is the result from the cell lines. You've got cell line name over here for sample names. And then all of these lines represent what I just showed with the circles, right? If they were circled together, that's a line. They were linked together. How do we know how many clusters are in this data set? Well, we decide. It's the threshold that we give it. So this would be two clusters if we just cut it off right there. This would be four clusters if we cut it off right there. Or this would be eight clusters if we cut it off right there. So basically, the height is a measurement that we can use to uh, put a threshold. And the result would either be visual like this, or it will be the cluster number assigned to a specific sample. So let's take a look at the result of the pipeline. So first of all, you have this PDF, which is going to be the dendrogram. And this is the DCIS data set, right? So a different data set. Now, what do we see here? We see here a normal cluster right here, right? Because this is already normalized. And then we can say, well, okay, and we just see all the rest right here, right? But in reality, within all the rest, there's at least a number of other significant subclusters. And so if I forget about the number of clusters I told it that I expected, I can use this to also try and understand what should I be expecting. And that's why this particular method of clustering is useful as an exploration tool. Yeah. Mine is kind of different compared to yours. Maybe you didn't use the normalized. Did you use the normalized data or? So, I mean, I'll, I can take the wrong. Huh? Interesting. So I don't know what exactly you used here. It looks like you didn't use the normalized, you used the unnormalized. Which is a good example, right? So now, can you uh, give me the pipeline ID? So 7943. So what you see here is the result from normalized, and, and he ran um, for, what is it again, 388? Where is it? I can see it. Right here at the top. 7943. Seven, seven, uh, seven, so if I just change this, I will see his results. And this is the result from non-normalized. So you can see that the normal are still clustered together, but they're kind of in the middle, right? Now, of course, we know that this is normal, so this is cheating, but it's just to give us an insight into how, you know, these different methods are affecting what we can interpret. So you can see that in the unnormalized, there is some group right here, which seems to be luminal, A and B grouped together, right? But then you've got all of this stuff over here, so it's really unclear what it is, but here, um, you can see, and you can kind of read into, you know, what might be the reasoning behind them clustered together, right? So these are all luminal B uh, together. Uh, these are, maybe they're all white, you know, or some other parameter that you can try to um, interpret. But right now, what we're interested in, in the context of using this, is just to explore our data, right? Let's 
now consider that we have explored our data. So, so is everything clear about kind of what's the usefulness of these methods? Okay. So we talked about dendrogram and how we can kind of do it. Now let's talk about, let's say we know we've studied a group of samples. We kind of understand pretty well what they are and what they do. And we have a new data set. And that problem is called the classification problem. So instead of using the information about how they are different, I can just train a machine and not knowing what it does, it will then start telling me what it thinks a new sample is. So I can create a training data set and I label it for the machine and I tell it this is uh, DCIS, this is not DCIS, or somehow more complicated. For example, in our cell line data, I have four or five different types. I can make a data set that has good representation of those types, give it a new training data, a test data set, and it will tell me what it is. So what are some of the methods that do that? And what are some of the ideas behind this? The simplest idea is a binary decision tree. What is a binary decision tree? What it does is it looks at a simple threshold that can explain the differences in the data. In the same way that we were looking at the PCA, where we can just take expression of a gene and say, does this gene show us enough information about the differences between our samples that I could just set a threshold? For example, um, is there like a laser in here? So what you can see here is X less than 0 0.21 or 29, that is a gene. So is there a specific threshold of expression that I can say that lower than or higher than can separate all of our values? And for cell lines, there are two genes that actually do that very well. TRIM3 and EPCAM, they actually, the first one separates everything from luminal. And the second one separates the other ones in between themselves. So basically it, it takes and separates everything into types, classes. Now, and we'll do this in a second. Uh, or actually, you know, let, let's run some of this so that we don't um, spend time waiting. So let's go under areas of analysis under supervised analysis this time. And we can upload under cell lines, we have supervised 7,000 genes. We can start from this. And we have test and train. We'll first just upload them as is, and then I'll show you what is inside those files and how to prepare them yourself. Now you do have to specify, you don't always have to name them test and train, but you have to specify which one is train and which one is test. So the test will go under test, train under train. And now we can do a decision tree right here. And while we're here, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the 15 genes. Um, so instead of 7,000 genes, you have another folder here that's called 15 genes. And again, both files. And we can do the train here, test here. Now, the problem with this data set, if I go back to uh, differential gene expression, is that I have more than two groups, right? So if I wanted to achieve the same result with 
um, differential gene expression or, or some statistical test, I would have to do multiple comparisons between each other or ANOVA or something like that. And this also gives me, unfortunately, the limitation of decision tree is that it will try to minimize how many genes it actually relies on to separate between these classes. So the way to overcome that is random forest. And so random forest is a very popular technique for classification <laughs> that relies on the idea of decision trees. But it kind of uh, is, a, is a smart implementation of decision trees because what it does is two things. It's bagging, so it takes different portions of the data set, not different portions of samples, but different portions of genes, of features, and it tries to run decision tree multiple times on that portion. So it randomly selects portions, you know, let's take these 10 genes, these 50 genes, these 100 genes, and run decision tree. And then it can evaluate the results in terms of accuracy of prediction, because you know what your end result should be, right? You know what the test or the trained data set contains, and in terms of its stability. What is accuracy? Well, if you imagine, um, fortunately I don't have that picture here, but if you imagine um, a circle, right, and you're trying to use decision tree to cut it out from the rest, what you will have is a jagged edge, right, that could be kind of rough. So it doesn't give you very good precision. If you take small portions along the line of that circle, you can separate it into smaller cutting uh, you know, points, and therefore you can get more precision. The second one is stability. And stability refers to some gene consistently, some feature consistently coming up as significant for this separation. So if it consistently comes up, that means it's more stable from our prediction. And then class with maximum votes gets assigned to the sample. Okay, so let's take a look at the result. Um, well, okay, we'll just do decision tree. So let's take a look at the 7,000 genes. Have to download the zip file with all of your results. And inside you have a plot that looks similar to what I was showing you before, right? So you have two genes that explain almost all the variation inside of your uh, data set. And now you can, for example, take a look at what is this gene. Again, it's HPX. And then you can take a look at what is this gene, but right, but the rules are fairly easy to interpret. So this gene above a certain will be luminal, below a certain number will be other kinds, right? Above this. So it's actually telling you how it is doing this kind of stuff. Now let's take a look at the um, other result for the 15 genes. And this shows you really the problem of decision tree. The problem is that it will always find something. Most of the time it will find something. I mean, obviously, if it can't be separated, it's not going to find anything. But if you feed it something, it's going to come up with a result that best represents the difference between the classes. So the input is going to be very significant, right? So random forest actually overcomes this problem because it does the same thing many times. So if I give it less amount of genes, it will come up with a different number of genes. If I give it other ones, it will come up with other ones. But a random forest will figure out which ones are the most stable and the most 
contributing to accuracy. So let's run random forest and we'll take a look at the output. So again, we can upload the same, uh, let's do 7,000 genes. It doesn't make sense to do 15. Now you have a lot of um, options here for uh, random forest. There's a couple different options, but uh, a parameter that you can change is the number of trees that it will run. It will just take longer if you add more, or run faster if you run less. And of course, more reliable if you do more. Now what you can do also, um, is you can see there's a random forest multi-run. So as you can see, the re repetition of the same thing multiple times will increase your accuracy and your reliability of the results. And so doing this more time, and you can force this uh, platform to do it for you uh, and combine different methods together, but doing it more times will give you more precise and more reliable results. So, but right now we don't need that. So let's just look at our pipelines and do people normally do people normally do like a thousand iterations or something? Like you can do whatever. I mean, there's a lot of papers. I, it depends on how many classes you have. Depends on how many features you've got. Right? It depends on a lot of things. But yeah, you can just play around with it. So. As we're waiting, let me just tell you quickly how to prepare the input files. So I actually have to prepare it for the DCIS, right? So in DCIS, what we saw is that there are two classes, maybe three classes, right? So I will prefer to say there's three classes because actually the paper, the paper that published this data set, that was their conclusion, that they identified one class of DCIS patients that was more uh, prone to become, uh, to develop these more aggressive tumors and some class that wasn't. So that would be our interest. How can we separate them? So if I go back to my dendrogram, and by the way, you can see how this kind of resembles a dendrogram as well. That would be um, interesting for the future discussion. So if I look at this, this is the normalized. I can see that within the normalized, right? So you remember the group of samples that was kind of off to the, to the side? They're right here, right? So you can see that you kind of have, okay, these guys right here. So they were off to the side. Um, and if you see over here, I kind of have, you know, this separation with, with this group, and then I have within it another separation of this group. So what I can really do is maybe separate it into this group and this group. And now, based on just my understanding of the data that I got from clustering, I will prepare a train and a test data set so that I can create a machine that will tell me why. So I can go back to my um, original data set and you have this, um, let's take the normalized one that I prepared. So this would be right here. And we can open it back up in Excel. Maybe it's open. And now what I want to do is I, it depends on what I want to do, right? I can either want to know why the separation happens or I actually want to test whether my machine will work accurately on a new data set, so cross-validation. So in my case, I want to know why. So what I will do is I will take the names of the columns, which are my samples, and I can just paste them here and uh, transpose them so that I get them as names of rows. And as you can see, my 
uh, labeling here at the end is very simple, right? I have normal, basal, whatever, but I want to now take a look at my uh, dendrogram and uh, label it according to what I separated there. Did you just kind of arbitrarily pick those separations? I mean, not completely arbitrarily, but it's, I'm just wondering why you didn't pick those four that clustered separately. I can, you know, because you want to, I want to. <laughs> it just makes more sense to me with the way the clusters are. Sure. So we'll do the right thing. And we'll do it like that. Okay, so I've got the normal, so I can keep those as normal. And then I've got these four, which is easier, which is a good thing. So 361, which is right here. So I'll call it DCIS1. And 362, 63, uh, and 59. And thank you, Excel, for fixing things that you shouldn't. Okay, so this is my DCIS1, and now I can just but sort this. And all the rest is going to be DCIS2. So now what I want to do is I want to, um, first of all, go back and sort this to how it was. And then I want to take this uh, column, go in here, insert a row first. And now I'll call this class. And just transpose. Okay, so now I've annotated these and created a training data set that will tell the machine what I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and save this. And I will save it as um, I will save it as a train as a txt file. Just remember that it needs to be txt. Okay, so I will just call it this norm train and what I can do is just delete this well, actually I, I do have um, that file so I don't need to do anything so I'll just copy it back over here. and just for myself so I remember I'm going to keep it as test. All right, so now let's create our pipeline. So I'll take my test and train. Is my training test. And let's create random forest. As this is running, let's take a look at the results from the 7,000 G. Right, so everybody got that pipeline finished, the random forest one. So I just go back inside, 
go to download pipeline files, and then I can have random forest all results is what I will pick and open that zip file. And let's see what it has inside. So first of all, it is going to give me um, prediction for the classes, right? So I gave it in my training set for this data set. I separated them so that actually not all the same files, not all the same samples are in both tables. So I want to know here whether it did an accurate job. So this prediction right here is the predicted class from the training data set on a data set that Random Forest did not know anything about, right? So if we go back and check, we will actually see that it did a pretty good job, did perfectly what we told it to do, but it also gave us, as a result here, the feature importance. And that is really what we are interested in. The feature importance is going to be genes that have a large mean decrease in accuracy. So eliminating that gene from the data set will actually cause the accuracy of prediction to decrease a lot. And now I have a list of my 15 genes, which is how we got the other data set. So this is just a way to select those genes that are going to be most informative for the classification. Now, if I do this many times, this list can improve in its quality. Now, 15 genes is not good enough probably, right, for biological interpretation. If I have, you know, tens of thousands of genes to start from, and I want to go to some pathway annotation, and each pathway has maybe, you know, 50 to 100 genes in it, what am I going to do with 15 genes? It's not going to be enough for me to accurately, um, to accurately identify some pathway or some biological process. So I want to enrich this list. So what I can do is now go back to using clustering to create a data set from these genes that are all going to be clustered similar to the genes that I've selected using random forest. So now I can go back and take my original expression table, plug in only the, the 15 genes that I have right here, and consider different methods for clustering that are now going to be looking at the same variability but based on the genes and not the samples. So don't do transpose, okay? And there, I just have to tell you, this is beyond the scope of this workshop, but there, when you deal with expression values and separation between genes, you probably want to use a different measurement of distance based on density. And so we have a few methods here that do density-based clustering instead of Euclidean distance. So that is the way that you can use these different methods. I just don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip over a few things. So that is how you can use a combination of supervised or unsupervised and supervised methods to first understand your data, then do some analysis that will give you a number of genes that you're looking for, and then transform that into a data set that you can take into downstream interpretation. Now let's take a look at the result of our latest pipeline. And by the way, here, if you want to get a visual, uh, you can go over here and go into Random Forest, and you have a... Um, you have... Yeah, so actually this didn't work. Let's go back and this typically happens because the data set isn't prepared correctly. And by correctly, what I mean is the names and the links of different um, columns and rows. 
So probably what I need to do is I need to simplify this naming. So I'll just do that really quickly because um, this is what you need to pay attention to when you're doing this kind of stuff. Let me just quickly make the right data set. Okay, what I want to do is just take these simple names so it's not too long. Okay, let me just say that again. I don't have anything extra in here. So for the test, you can also just delete this row, save it as test. Oh yes, and uh, another thing to be mindful of is just using uh, dashes. So let me remove that as well. Let me try this. Okay, so as we're waiting, let's just finalize this. So in terms of other methods that you have, and this is useful to know for feature selection and also for classification, two other important categories of methods that are available are discriminant analysis, which means that I want to separate, again, in the same way like random forest, but using a different method. Um, separate by using a straight line between my groups of samples. And you have a number of different types of uh, discriminant analyses. And the final one that is more focused on efficiency are support vector machines. Why efficiency? Because when you have a lot of uh, data and a lot of noisy data, right, that could be useful for random forest uh, it's not going to work for linear discriminatory analysis because you have a lot of correlated values within the data set. But at some point, you get to uh, good uh, precision in your classification, but you want to generalize it and you want to make it effective so that you actually see a new sample come in and you can apply that and trust the accuracy. And a good method to do that is support vector machines because it uses a trick to transform the data called kernel basically transform in a, in a specific way the, the numbers that you deal with so that you can have a new dimension where you can simply uh, cut the threshold between uh, the two types or several types of uh, classes. Um, and it actually uses distance to the edges of classes, which gives it a lot more precision um, compared to some of these other methods. So that's just good to know. Um, and you've got some of those things. So now let's talk about interpretation. How do we interpret this data that we got to get a biologically meaningful um, understanding? So the first thing that we obviously need to do is to translate ENSG to some normal, understandable gene name and genome biology, et cetera. So let's do that. It's a very simple procedure. You take in the IDs of genes that you want, and then you convert them uh, to 
a gene symbol and you can have the option to have gene ontology. Probably you can do this using David or some online database because you need a database to convert one to the other. So here, let me just quickly demonstrate how you would do that. You can go back under utilities and let us add, uh, so under cell lines, we have here the list of those 15 genes that we selected using random forest. Continue. And here under annotation, we'll just use the older ensemble database for all of these NSGs. And all you need to say is where is the gene ID itself and which column. So it's in column one. Save. Okay, so this is. The other thing that you might want to do, and we'll take a look at the results here in a second, but I think it would be good to just finalize what you can do here, is what's called gene enrichment. And for gene enrichment, what you need is the full change and the p-value. So if you did differential gene expression, or let's say you have t-test results, right, and you have the column for the p-value and a full change that could be either log full change or it could be adjusted for FDR, which would be a p-adjusted value or something like that. So any result from DSEC or HR or manually created, you can then um, also use this gauge analysis, which is the gene set enrichment analysis that will actually give you the pathways and produce images of those pathways that you can see up and down regulated genes on them. So to do that, let's just upload the results from the sec, for example. And here again, you have to practice under gauge, you have uh, the sec two. Now in DSEC2, it's important to remember which uh, column is which, because you have to um, say it here. So you're looking for, you know, the first is going to be, um, you know, your ID of the gene, and then you have log twofold change, which is one, two, three, four, right? Um, and then you've got the P adjusted value. Actually. So. Okay, so here are the columns. So the first one is the gene ID, then you have the log twofold change, and then you've got the P adjusted value is, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus four, and eight. Gene ID is one. Gene difference, that would be log full change. This would be four. And here for your threshold, this will this is used to generate the images. So if you want to select uh, you know, only a few that were mapped. So this is uh, a threshold for pathways, not for genes. You can increase it. So you can do, for example, 0 0.9, right? And that will give you a lot of flexibility on what will be considered significant. Okay, so this is gauge. Okay, so unfortunately our time ran out. Um, let's just take a look before we um, finish at the results of these two pipelines.
didn't work again. I gotta look at my table again and see what's wrong with that one. I need to just check on the annotation. So here's the result from the annotation, just what it looks like. So here you can see for each gene, the common name, gene symbol, and then you have description of each gene and the gene ontology. So multiple gene ontology domains. And since we don't have time to look at the output from Gage, I included here the zip file, and that is the result from Gage. So if you unzip that, you will see the pathways, and then you can see based on full change what is up and down regulated. So the top, you also have here a text file, which is going to list out the pathways. So you can see that the gene sets are pathways, and then you have the p-value and the q-value and the set size. So you will find those images inside and uh, the data in that table. So that's it. Um, I hope that it wasn't too fast this time. Uh, if it was, then I think the majority of this stuff is online. Uh, if you find something that's missing online, let us know. We'll update it or um, try and add additional information. If you have any technical issues, you're welcome to reach out to us and tell us this is the name of the pipeline. It's not working. We'll take a look and we'll try to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here. So. Unfortunately, I'm not normal.